1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Uh, I'm going to continue some studies that we've done in some of our uh, some of our small groups. I've done the, this particular study actually a number of times with some of our uh, students and with some of our kids, some of our children. But I didn't realize um, how critical understanding what I'm about to teach you, understanding this is for really opening your eyes and opening our hearts for what Scripture says. What I'm about to share with you is something that you will find all throughout New Testament, and you can even find it in the Old Testament as well. Um, so what I want us to do is I want us to break down this whole thing of body, soul, and spirit. But the reason I want to do this is because we have to understand John chapter 3 says that lest I be bo- unless you be born again, you have to be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. You have to be born again to have eternal life. There has to be a new birth. And so we have to understand and grab a hold of what this new birth is really all about. It says in John chapter 3 that you're born, there's this thing of being born twice, born of water, meaning born of the flesh, because right after that it actually tells you what born of water is. It says it. Uh, That's not referring to baptism. It's referring to natural birth. The reason we know that is because it's two verses back to back, and the second verse actually explains the first one. And it says that you, those that are born of the flesh are flesh, and those that are born of the spirit are spirit. Literally, right after it says that you're born of, there's two births, both water and spirit. Makes sense? So you can go back, you can read all of that in John chapter 3 in its full context. But what I want us to understand is what, um, how we are created and how this ties to our relationship with God. Because as we look at it, what we see is it also is a great filter for all of Scripture. I mean, it's powerful. You don't realize how much what I'm about to share with you, how much this concept shows up in the Bible. So looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting with verse 23, it says this. Now may the God of peace sanctify himself, sanctify you. What is the word? Do you see it? Completely, right? There's this whole thing of may you be sanctified in full entirety. May you be sanctified completely. By the way, the term sanctification talks about being set apart. There's a process of sanctification. When we're surrendered to him, he sets us apart, he sanctifies us, but he continues to purify us. There's that sanctification that occurs. And he's saying, may this be done in its entirety. May it be done in full completion. And it says, and may your whole, see that word right there? Whole. Do, they think, think they, do you think these two words might be significant? Yeah. So we're talking about entirety, we're talking about completion, we're talking about whole. And then he goes on to say, your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why this is important. I want us to understand, and I I, I don't know um, how much, how many of y'all know about cars? Anybody? You drive one? Okay. Or other people drive you around in them. You know that part. There's an engine in a car. Can we at least agree on that? Do you all know the difference between a six-cylinder and an eight-cylinder? The price. Amen. Can I get an amen? Yeah. The price for a tune-up, it's a tune-up. It's a whole lot more expensive to do a V8 or an eight-cylinder. Anyway, there's more to this. What happens is in a cylinder, that's where you get your fire or your combustion. That's where the power for the engine occurs is in each one of these cylinders. I'm not saying this as a mechanic or somebody who completely understands how a motor works, but I do understand how many cylinders. So you have more cylinders. Typically, you have more power that way. What I want you to understand is that you and I are, just go with the symbolism, we are three-cylinder engines. Based upon this verse, we are three-cylinder engines. We have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. And I'll draw for you. And it may be awful, but I just want you to go with it, okay? So these cylinders, why are they called cylinders? Because they are cylindrical. Work with me, people. It's not that hard. They're not called squares. All right, they're not called cubes, they're called cylinders, and the firing happens in this, say, okay, so there was a three-cylinder car back in the day, it was the Geo Metro. 
beautiful vehicle. One of the things that was so pretty about this vehicle was you could actually take six or seven really strong people and you could pick it up and move it somewhere else. That was what was one of the coolest things of it. In addition to that, um, it would make it up most hills. It didn't have a whole lot of power, but I want you to know they've come a long way in three-cylinder engines. Three cylinders is not a lot of cylinders for an engine. Most are, nowadays we have a lot of four-cylinder engines. We have six cylinders, we have eight cylinders. There's some that are, the Jaguars are like 12 cylinders. So you've got these bigger engines in these supercars. Now, nowadays they have a, a high-class three-cylinder, the BMI i8. Zero to 60 in 4.3 seconds, 4.2 seconds. That's super fast, right? See, nowadays they can do a little bit more with that kind of engine. They can tune it a whole lot tighter, and they can make that thing run fast. The reason this is important is we have to understand that we are a three-cylinder engine. Here's the deal. We are created in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Write it down. I want you to take as many notes as you can because I'm telling you, this teaching will change the way that you look at yourself and you look at life if you understand this. This is crucial, and if you start to see this clearly, you'll actually start to see a lot of scriptures come to life that you probably didn't think of this way before. You'll think of the whole rebirth thing based upon this with more clarity possibly too. Here's what you have to understand. We are body, soul, and spirit. We're created in the image of God. It says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, let us make man in our image. If you don't believe me, go look for yourself. We are made in the image of God. We don't look alike, but we have something similar to God, and that is that we are three in one. Come on. You have a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit, because 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 says it. It specifically says that. That you would be, he's talking about the sanctification process, that it would be complete, that you would be whole. Now we break this down and we try to figure out what body, soul, and spirit. I actually, I I went back to my last message last week and I misspoke on something. And that was, this word soul, when I started to, to really break it down and look at it in the original language, it actually goes back to the breath of life. Our natural breath actually had ties to our soul. And last week, I I deviated on that a little bit, and I apologize. Uh, I wanted to go back to the original context, and the reason is is because I want to look at these words as they are in Scripture. I want us to make sure we understand this according to God's Word. And according to God's Word, we have a body. Um, In the Godhead, that would be Jesus. In the soul, the Godhead, that would be the Father. And the Spirit would be There's only one more left, people, seriously, right? And the name is in the name, okay? So Holy Spirit, we're created in his image. Here's the issue that we have. Before we are born again, we're only running on two cylinders. Because if you break down the scripture, what you find is that the spirit, we're actually dead in the spirit, I'll give you some verses here in a second. I want you to see this, okay? This body, this is our physical physical makeup, right? This is our physical makeup. The soul. This is tied to, literally, when he goes back, he says he breathed breath into their physical, the breath of life, all the way back in chapter 2 of Genesis. That's that breath of life, but it's also the mind. It's your emotions. It's your uh, personality, All of that is tied, personality, Um, it's tied to our personality. This is our soul, and it makes us different from each other. You can have two people that are identical twins, same DNA, but they actually have two different personalities because of the soul of them. You could clone somebody. Nowadays, they're talking about all that junk. If you were to clone somebody, same bodies, right? But what would be different? There would be different personalities. You could raise them in two different places, Because of circumstance and situation and emotions, things would be different. Make sense? Now, I want you to look at this. This is, the Spirit is what ties us to God. This is our connection point to God. All right? This is dead when we are walking in sin. 
That's why we must be born again, born of the Spirit. That's what it says in John chapter 3, born of the Spirit. And look at this. I don't know if you've noticed this, but this right here is, uh, we would call it material. And we would call these two things immaterial. Meaning the flesh is tangible. You can see it. Make sense? These two are immaterial. Check this out. This is natural. Both of these are natural. This is supernatural. Anybody having fun yet? This is supernatural right here. All right? And so what you look at is, look at how the soul lines up with the immaterial. And there's something incredible about the soul, isn't there? There's something incredible. But here's what's happening right now. I mean, there's a lot of stuff on the page, right? But what's happening is before we're born again, we are literally firing on only two cylinders. One is completely cold. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm actually going to read... One all the way down to verse 10. My physical body says I need to get glasses. So I'm going to do that real quick. <laughs> all right. It says, and you were. Come on, talk to me. You were dead. I didn't say it. Scripture says it, right? You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Get this, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Do you realize that there are people that chase after spiritual things, but they are false? That's why I, I want you all to understand something. When we're dead like this, this is the God-shaped hole. I mean, you've heard so many people say, before I gave my life to Christ, I felt like I had this God-shaped hole inside of me. And then when I got saved, it's like he filled that hole. Have you heard that before? We've used that as an analogy. And really, in essence, that's what's happening is we have this part of us that is dead. Here's what happens is we walk around searching for God, and then we search for it using our body and soul. And that's why we get caught up. And all of these false gods and these idols. We even throw, you ready for this? Physical medication at spiritual problems. Oh, he's preaching now. We do it. And see, I'm telling you, this brings so much clarity to who we are. If we can understand how we're made, how we're built, we are created in the image of God, to be in a relationship with God, and that's why we walk around aimlessly when we're lost. We crave after a relationship with God, and we fill it with bad relationships. We crave a relationship with God, and we fill it with alcohol and drugs, you name it. You go down the list. I, I, I chased after all that stuff and could not find a filling. Why? Because only Christ can fill this void. Only God's Spirit can fill this void through a relationship with Jesus. It says, uh, walk in the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the Spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our natural. See it? In the flesh. Carrying out the desires of the... Do y'all see this coming to life? Like I've read this a lot of different ways, but when you look at it through this context and through this lens, this verse comes to life. And it says, um, out of the desires of the body and the mind, which is tied to the soul. You continue on, it says, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, what did he do? He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming age he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. Y'all know this verse? 
For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship. We were created in his image. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. In them, see. Here's what happens: is when we surrender our life to Christ, when we give in. By the way, it's for it is by grace through faith that you are saved. Grace is His choice; faith is our choice. But can I tell you, He chose you before He ever gave you an option to make a choice. He chose you. Long before you ever, so yeah, for those of you, those are like, he's the one that made the choice. Absolutely. For God so loved the world, that's everybody, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He chose you. By grace we are saved. It's not of works. It's grace through faith. Faith is our choice. And you know what scripture says in, in Romans chapter 10 verse 17? It says, here's how faith comes to life. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When the word of God is present, guess what happens? Seeds are planted and faith begins to grow. And that's when we go, I'm going to either choose this or not. Which brings us to this whole thing of the spirit. And what happens is, when we surrender our life to Christ, this part of us comes to life. Woo! And how many people have said, when they got saved... I, for once in my life, I felt complete. I felt whole. There was a joy I can't even explain that occurred. Something happened. You've been down that road before? Yeah. This helps explain a lot of that, doesn't it? But what if we took this and we tied it to more scripture? I'm telling you, I want you to start looking at Scripture through this context just to see the difference, okay? What if you were to go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12? For the Word of God, it's living and it's active. I want to do this. I'm going to erase a little bit, a little bit of this. Do y'all got it all written down? Good. We're going to bring this to life. We're going to bring the Spirit to life here. All right, so now we have this connection connected with God, right? Now we're filling this whole thing complete. So you go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And that scripture says that the word of God is living and it's active, right? It says that it's sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing. Are you ready? Soul. See it? Spirit, are y'all having fun yet? Ready? Joint and marrow. What is that? That's the body, y'all. I don't know any other thing it can be, right? Why is this important? This is important because the Word of God, when it comes to life in our life, in our life, what it does is it starts to show us what is body, what is soul, and what is spirit. It starts to separate our emotions from spiritual things. The Word of God allows us to walk in truth because it goes, hang on a second, that's just an emotional thing. Hang on a second, that's a fleshly thing. Hang on a second, that's a spiritual thing, walk in that. That's why we always talk about how the Word of God is so important for us. Well, now we can see why. Because what the Word of God does is it brings all of this to life and it starts to separate what is what so that we can follow what is Him. Are y'all tracking with me? I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty exciting stuff. Because you can look at that verse, and we've read that verse so many times, and what we do is we clue on the Word of God is living and active, and we kind of stop there. But there's so much more to that verse than just the first part of it. Because it says that it separates to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. Ready? It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. Woo! Y'all aren't having as much fun as I am. That's okay. That's okay. I just want us to process this in light of what it says. It's saying that Scripture, the Word, brings to light what you're really dealing with 
and who you are. Because I can't tell you how many times when I've been counseling people, I'm sitting there listening to them and they're talking about things that are just emotional things. And you're going, please don't make a decision based upon your emotions. What does God say about this situation? Uh, the, another verse that comes to mind is Mark chapter 14, verse 38. The importance of prayer. Tell me if I'm off on this. Watch and pray so that you would not fall into temptation. What does it say? For the spirit is willing, but the... Come on, y'all. Isn't that something? Like, doesn't that explain to us the significance and the power of prayer in our life? He's saying, I want you to watch and pray. Could you not watch and pray for one hour? I mean, come on, just sit and talk to me for one hour. Why? Because I, I want you to understand temptation is coming, and I don't want you to succumb to it. Watch and pray. Listen to my voice. Communicate with me. Why? Because the Spirit is willing, but I know how your flesh is. It is weak. Y'all, I went through Scripture after Scripture after Scripture, and I'm telling you, it just gets better and better and better as you start to look at Scripture through this lens. I'm going to tell you why. I'll give you another example. So you would go to Romans, the end of Romans chapter 7. If y'all remember this conversation that Paul's having with the people, the Roman people, and it, it says this. He's talking about there's a battle that's going on inside of him. I do what I don't want to do or what I shouldn't do. I know I'm not supposed to. Y'all know that? And then I don't do what I know I'm supposed to do. And he said, then there's a battle that is being, re it's basically being waged in my mind. You remember that? And then he says, who can save me from this body? I'm telling you, it's all through the scriptures. He said, who can save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then you go to the next chapter. It's chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the, ready? Spirit of life. Come on. The spirit of life has set us free from the laws of sin and death. That's good stuff. And it's all tied to this. Scripture after scripture after scripture. And understanding that God is wanting us to know that we're created in his image. And can I tell you, that's why when I'm going to I'm going to go back to last week's message. It's important for us to worship in spirit and in truth. I got one more thing I want to say. The Father seeks after those who worship in spirit and truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the... Come on, are y'all not having fun? That was a touchdown thing right there. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Unless you be born again, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. Y'all, I want you to take it this week as you're searching through scripture. And I just want you to see it come to life. And understand that we are created in a beautiful image. Beautiful image. And here's what I think. I think so many times what happens as believers, we start getting so focused on the body and the soul of things that we start to lose power in the spirit. We've got to continue to seek the face of God. And have his spirit continually fill us to overflowing so that we can walk in full power, completely sanctified and whole. Would you stand with me?